I'm Tim. This is uh, Hibiscus Syriacus, or you might know it as Rose of Sharon. Um, this is uh, Brassica olaricea, or better known as broccoli. It's the flower of a broccoli plant. It's the part we eat. Um, and the, the flashes are from lights changing inside of an indoor farm. Um, so I have somewhat of a unique relationship with these plants, and I suppose plants in general. I'm a biology researcher and an engineer, and the work that I do with them might best be described as decoding plants, or if I could borrow the, the title of this block, um, decoding how plants express themselves. Um, so before I, I dive into that work, I, I just want to thank uh, everybody at TED for giving me a, another opportunity to wear a microphone along my ear. It was precisely uh, five years ago that I dressed as uh, Justin Bieber as for Halloween. <laughs> and uh, it's just such a great look for me. I, I just appreciate it, so thank you, Ted. <laughs> but back to plants. <laughs> um, so my, my professional relationship with plants started a few years ago when I was doing research as part of uh, Dr. Lizzie Wolkovich's Temporal Ecology Lab at uh, Harvard, just across the river. And our group was deeply interested in a topic called um, phenology. Uh, now, phenology is simply the study of an organism's life events. Uh, you and I have life events like birth and graduation and marriage and potentially, but hopefully not divorce. Uh, plants also have life events, but they're morphological. It's their change in their form. So for instance, we're in the midst of one right now. Um, fall senescence is a phenological event. Um, but our lab group was mostly interested in the spring corollary to that event, which is uh, bud burst. Um, and I can walk you through what that looks like. This is when the, the leaves emerge from their winter dormancy. Um, this is a white ash bud um, during dormancy, later to uh, its swelling stage, onto it. Uh, breaking open, its shoot elongating, and um, as spring continues, um, its leaves forming. Now there are um, two distinct biochemical um, cues for the plant to go through that morphological change, or, or cues for it to actually express that leaf. One is the springtime's uh, extended day length, so the photo period. Um, and the second is uh, springtime's warming temperatures. Now, um, which of those two variables is the main driver of that expression of a leaf um, is a huge ecological question that's yet unanswered. Um, so that's the one my group went after answering, and we did it by uh, setting up a few experiments, as scientists do. Um, we collected hundreds of twigs, literally just cuttings off of trees, uh, between here and Montreal of about 30 different woody tree species, or woody species, I should say. Um, these are my old colleagues, Jahan and Dan, as we are scavenging for our species. And we would take those cuttings or twigs back to our lab and put them in just a splash of water in a flask and then enter them into a growth chamber where we could incubate them in these different spring environments or different simulations of spring. So we could really parse out whether photo period or temperature was that driver of leaf expression. Um, now, critical to that work was having some sort of standard way of deciphering my subjective observations um, and turning them into objective data points. So I, need so I needed a rubric that could tell me um, what, what was I looking at, and, and what stage should I record that plant? Um, so I used a rubric like this, um, and I would enter my chamber, and for example, I would record that white ash as a stage 10, where its shoot is elongated. So I'm, I'm effectively decoding these morphological state, uh, stages into data points. Um, and data collection ensued. Um, and there was quite a lot of it. I had about 250 twigs in each of four growth chambers. And 
I took data points or collected data twice a week for 10 weeks for a total of 20,000 measurements. Um, that's a lot of data. And um, if that's not enough, I actually did it two years in a row. So that's 40,000 measurements that I took. And um, it nearly drove me insane. Um, <laughs> it, was, uh, it was difficult. Uh, it turns out science is very hard if you do it right. <laughs> and I salvaged the experience um, because each time I went in to measure this expression of a leaf, I, I, I began to admire it more and more. Um, these are really just amazing organisms. Uh, it, it seemed like they were designed almost uh, architecturally, the, the way their leaves unfolded and unpacked from the buds. And it uh, spurred me to deploy my camera and attempt to make a, a different visual rubric or data set because these weren't quite capturing the, the beauty that I was seeing in, in the buds and in, in my uh, species. So uh, I started doing computational photography or, or time-lapse photography, like this shot of a lilac flower inside of uh, one of the growth chambers. This is uh, several weeks of photography happening here. Um, spoiler alert, it dies. <laughs> I showed you a, a white ash. This is a black ash bud. There's a little bit of a delay at the beginning of this. So um, this is the, the bud um, breaking open and the leaf emerging. It's just really um, cool to watch, uh, or at least to photograph. So. Um, a as I was taking these measurements and doing these photos, I, I added mechanical engineering onto the project and started fabricating my own actuators for my camera. So this is a rail that I built to take more cinematic shots with movement, like um, this shot of a hamamelis leaf opening. So the camera is actually uh, traversing along a rail. So what happened here is, is that I, I noticed a, you know, a change in my own form, right? I went from a, a biologist to a computational photographer to a uh, mechanical engineer. And um, I'm still not sure how my dad feels about this, but an artist as well. Um, <laughs> and I very uh, gratefully have the privilege of wearing all of those hats simultaneously um, at MIT Media Lab now where I am decoding plants in a different way. Um, and I'm also a farmer for that cause. Um, so in the work I just described, I was really using computation and engineering to, to decode how plants express their morphology or their form, really how we see plants. And uh, at the Media Lab, we're doing work to decode their flavor or how we taste plants. And I'd, I'd love to show you what that looks like. I'm a part of uh, the Open Agriculture Initiative at MIT Media Lab, where uh, we are building open source hardware and software to sort of re-envision the future of agriculture. This is a piece of hardware we built called uh, the Food Computer. And the group's led by Caleb Harper. Before I get into what a food computer does, I'd, I'd appreciate it if um, the members of this audience could potentially um, think of a flavor memory you have, um, a, a taste maybe when you were young of uh, a piece of fruit or a tomato that you wish you could have saved or captured, or, or, or at least you still remember. Um, I, I have one, my, my grandfather's blueberry bushes, we um, used to pick blueberries in my grandfather's backyard, and if only I could have saved uh, what those tasted like. Um, and, and how does that flavor come about? Well, you have a seed that has a certain set of genetics in it, right? And those genetics um, or that genome uh, determines how the plant will express its flavor. But also, you have something called the phenome, which is the whole suite of environmental variables that the plant experiences while it's growing that go on to express or not express those genetics in subsequent flavor. Um, so you have a, a seed, right? But you also have um, how much... CO2 is in the air when the plant's growing, uh, the temperature and humidity of the air in which it grows, uh, the schedule of water and rainfall, 
or the microbiome of the soil as wine growers know, or just the color of light that it experiences while it's growing that all add up to the phenome which um, caused this, this blueberry to express a particular flavor. Now what if we could decode the phenome of a particular flavor? Um, what if we could figure out which variables produce bitterness or, or sweetness. Um, well, we would certainly need some sort of tool for that, right? We would need a growth chamber like the ones I was using to control photo period and temperature. But what if, what if we built one that had more knobs you could turn for each of those variables? Um, well, we're at MIT, so yeah, we're doing that. And it's, <laughs> it's called the food computer. This is our, our young version uh, the personal food computer is sort of desktop size. <laughs> and, and I like to think about this as uh, sort of presets, almost like the, your, your car seat, right? Um, imagine if you could take that flavor memory, figure out the environment that produced it, save that as data, almost as a data file, and mail it or email it to a friend who has a food computer and has the same seed as you. And they could grow the, precisely the same flavor tomato or flavor blueberry as you, not merely just the same plant. And we call this um, environment recipes. And we think uh, this is going to change the way we grow food in the future. <coughs> um, so that was the personal food computer. Th this is our next generation of food computer. It's called the food server. And I'd like to actually just show you the inside. I, I just harvested our first plants and data this is an experiment I'm running on basil to see how UV light creates a tastier basil. Um, these are seedlings that I just germinated. I'm still somewhat reluctantly manually collecting data. And th this is a new food computer we just built. Uh, it's called a tree computer and we're building it for a candy company, but I'll save that for next year. And what I love about this work is that I'm not merely uh, just collecting data, but I'm, I'm actually building and designing the tools to do the science and to collect the data. Um, and as much as this talk has been about um, how plants express themselves, it's also been about how uh, I express myself through my work. And if we go back to form and taste, um, there was a transition in the form of my work, right? When you start off with this, this sort of sterile rubric um, of these growth stages, and, and I change that form to something more compelling and engaging like uh, this time lapse. Um, and with that change in form was a change in taste uh, where you have, um, or there was a change in taste whereby I went, I went from merely a biologist to um, having a more robust constellation of pursuits in engineering and design um, but it's still rooted in science because I would argue that this, this time lapse is actually just as scientifically rigorous and data rich as the rubric it was born from. So if I could offer um, some advice to any young folks in the audience just embarking on this work of decoding how they want to express themselves, um, there are so many entry points into science. Um, science and research need photographers and farmers, um, and I encourage you to continue this um, work that I hope shows that science and art aren't just two disciplines that play well together, but can often be the same thing. And if you have as, luck, as much luck as I have had, um, you will go from having an interest in ecology to arriving at an ecology between your interests. Um, so thanks for your time, I appreciate it.